Welcome to the Seattle Investors Club podcast with Julie Clark and Joe Bauer, where we share the nuts and bolts of real estate investing from our 20 plus years in the industry. Sit back, relax, listen, and immediately take action. Are you ready? Here we go. Welcome to the Nuts and Bolts of Real Estate Investing podcast. My name is Joe Bauer, and I'm here with my co host, Julie Clark. Julie, how are you doing today? I am doing exceptionally fantastic today, Joe. But I think, as all of us have figured out each week, um, nobody's doing quite as well as you. You are, <laughs> you are off showing us how to live. Um, and so rather than me bore you with the details of what Buddy and I are up to today, I will say um, Buddy is at the salon right now. That's our sidekick, my oh. labradoodle and um, man of the house, Buddy Clark, my dog. Um, but Joe is, I think, where are you in Rome right now? Give us the details. Yeah, we cruised in on a train today from, let's see, where were we? We're in Pompeii and we showed up in or traveled to Rome this afternoon. So I haven't even gotten my bearings yet. We, as you guys probably expected, went straight to the CrossFit gym, had a workout and then to the Airbnb. <laughs> Did you really? Yeah, that's how we, we, the best way to get info about areas and like where to eat and like what to do is the, the CrossFit community. So we go and we get out of town. That is hilarious to me. Not surprising. Hey, but I want (laughs) to, sorry guys, we're going to have a little talk here and you guys can just enjoy yourselves while we talk. Um, There's a newspaper there that you should get because I'm a major fan of Rome. Like my my thing, I was like, I got to get a place in the summer. And like every summer, I'm just going to go live in Rome for three months. But there's a newspaper yeah. there. I assume they still have it. And it's called Roma Che, like C with an apostrophe H-E or something like that. And it is the um, kind of like the stranger or the weekly, right, in, okay. in Rome, like we have here in Seattle. Um, but there is a super... Um, awesome outdoor venue, like music. It's kind of like where locals hang out with an, you know, like an outdoor awesome venue stage, you know, chilling out food drinks. And it's called Villa Chili Montana. Sounds weird. But and when you say it in Italian, it sounds a lot better. Not when you say <laughs> Seattle uh, Chili Montana, but that's what it sounds like. And you guys should definitely go there. And then my last tip, when you go to the Coliseum, start like from it, like like a mile away up the street and walk there, like get a mile away and don't like drive up to it or anything like that or have a taxi drop you off. Get way, way like a mile away and walk and it'll be a, it'll supersize the experience for you because it's so rad. So awesome. I'm jealous. We're not going to talk about real estate today. We're just going to talk about Rome and Italy and stuff like that. <laughs> oh, and make sure while you're there that you go to Siena, Italy, which is about, um, or is that from Florence? Maybe you have to go from know. Florence to Siena. Anyways, if you're right. going to be there, check out Siena, S-I-E-N-N-A. But I think the launch pad for that is from Florence. Okay. We'll be, we'll be in Florence sometime. So. Oh, man. Well, Awesome. So did you, did you, were you able to communicate with the people at the CrossFit or? Yeah, the, the people in Rome seemed to speak English really well. Uh, it was a little harder in Pompeii and it was pretty easy in Amalfi. So the people that were at the CrossFit gym, actually I had, I asked them where they were from because I couldn't tell their accent. They were that good and they were from wow. Rome. Super cool. Well, I found my transition because uh, today we have somebody on the line with us here at the Nuts and Bolts of Real Estate Investing that also actually has an accent. Okay. <laughs> Chad Carson, join us, guys. Hey, Chad, what's up? Hey, good to have you. I, I wish my accent was as, as nice as the Italian accent, but you know, some people might say so. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, guys, uh, Chad Carson is a, if you haven't heard of um, of Chad. Some people call him coach. I probably a lot of people call him coach and we're going to get to know him better today. But he is a real estate investor. A, I'm, gonna, I'm stealing this off your website, Chad, just so you know. Real estate cool. investor, world traveler, father of two beautiful children, loving husband, and real estate coach. Um, he's also a monthly blog contributor on Bigger Pockets. We all know Bigger Pockets. 
And his mission is to help you do more of what matters. And that means he wants to help you retire early so you can become financially independent and regain your most precious resource, which we all agree is our time. So we're going to get to know Chad better today, um, getting all inspired uh, with his ideas and thoughts and how we can all achieve the lifestyle Joe's living, I guess we'll say. Um, and instead of having to grind it out in the rat race every day for, for a buck. Um, again, welcome, welcome, welcome. Should we call you coach or should we call you Chad? Whatever, whatever feels good to you. You know, I, I do, I go by coach partly because of the real estate stuff, but I used to play football and love sports. And so when I started writing my blog and, and starting just sharing my story and information, it just felt natural to be, you know, I, some of my favorite teachers were always coaches. So I said, Hey, why, why don't I just take that, uh, that idea and try to translate it into real estate investing and business. So that's I love it. whatever works. I love it. Well, guys, we have, we, we decided to have um, coach, we'll say Chad on the, on the podcast, because you know, you know, when you're watching, I've been following him for quite a while myself. And you know, there's just some people that have a way of communicating way more effectively than others. Um, and that is, that's why we had like Bradley, uh, what was his last name? Smotherman, Summerman. I can't say it right. I'm drawing a blank. Yeah. Yeah. Pronounce his name correctly, but you guys will, we'll drop that one into the show notes today, but Chad's content and his, uh, eloquence, I mean, comes through, uh, just even online on all his website stuff and his newsletter and things like that. So let's get to know him a little bit better. Um, Thanks again, Chad, and Joe's going to kick us off. Yeah, Chad, so the first question is always about your history, your background. We like to get to know people uh, on the show as much as we can, so I'd love it if we could jump into the time machine. You could take us back to like where you grew up, how you grew up, what that did as far as like you know how you found real estate from that path. So if you could do that for us, we'd love it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I just want to start off saying I really appreciate y'all having me. This is, is a lot of fun. I love talking real estate and y'all have a great show. So it's awesome to be here. And uh, kind of the when, in the time machine for me, I was, I was actually very fortunate. You know, some people have stories of growing up and they had to kind of go against all odds. Well, my, my odds were kind of, I, I, I always use the quote from Warren Buffett. He said he won the ovarian lottery. <laughs> so like I, I did, I did pretty well. Like I, you know, had an upper middle class kind of upbringing and, and fortunately, in terms of real estate investing, my father had was an entrepreneur. He had a couple businesses that didn't work out, that failed. And so he kind of got, got to watch that from behind the scenes growing up. It wasn't always positive. But um, he also got into real estate investing when I was probably 12 or 13. And he had a lot of rental properties and used to flip some houses here and there. So I had that just, you know, it wasn't something I aspired to do growing up. But having that to observe, being able to observe my dad doing that. My mom participated as well in that. And then having all the books on the shelf, you know, I had like free education. And, you know, back when he was buying the education, it was a bunch of tapes, tape sets, like Carlton Sheets, tape sets on the, on the, that I could pull out and play, plug in the tape player. So that was uh, how I got started just learning about it during, during college. And I, I was, I thought I was going to go into like the biology kind of medical school route. That was my study during college and I actually studied German too. So I like foreign languages and kind of traveling, but I took a little bit of a detour right after college and I was trying to decide what I wanted to do. And I didn't really want to go to med school. I actually played football in college and got a college scholarship playing football at Clemson university. And I thought I was going to go to the NFL and that didn't really work out either. So I said, you know what, I'm just going to take a break and I think I just want to try something that's on my own, like without having to go and climb any ladders, without having to work for somebody else. I was just sort of drawn to this idea of being an entrepreneur and just trying to do it. And so I, right after college at 23, um, a friend and I started trying to invest in real estate, started uh, figuring out how to flip houses and find deals for other people. And it was sort of a slow start at first, you know, I didn't first six or seven months, I didn't make any money. And I was just living in the spare bedroom at my parents' house for a little while. Uh, but um, one thing led to another, I made a little bit of money, I learned how to find deals. And we could talk about the details of that story. But I was able to figure out how to find deals and flip houses first. And then over time started buying more rental properties and other things as well. And that's more where I am now is in the buy and hold business in a small college town called Clemson in South Carolina. 
And that's, that's kind of given me the, a different, different type of business model where I can have more consistent income. I love what Joe's doing, traveling the world. I'm jealous that he's in Italy right now. I've never been to Italy, but my family has been able to travel to Latin America a good bit. We spent 17 months in Ecuador in 2017 and 18. And it was always a dream of ours. And my wife teaches Spanish and my, we wanted our kids to be, become fluent in Spanish. So we lived in Cuenca, Ecuador. And all of that was kind of possible because we had uh, rental income coming in consistently that could pay for our lifestyle. That is awesome. My uh, nanny is from Cuenca, Ecuador, and my kids are 100% bilingual. Whoa, that's Isn't that awesome. Crazy? Small Little world. Little connection there. Yeah. yeah. Super rad. Um, shout out to, my, to her. We love you. Um, uh, so we're, when you were do, going through that learning to flip and all that, what was your first source of the education or who was the mentor or education group? If there was like a guru or somebody, or maybe it was the Carlton sheet, you know, tapes or something like that. Who were you listening to to learn how to flip or do your lead generation back then? I basically, I jumped in head first, like every single thing I could get. So like my dad had, he had the old school, like Carlton sheets on the, on the tape sets. He had, uh, he had some Ron Legrand. He had, uh, fortunately like John Schaub, he was really into like John Schaub and some of that kind of group of people, Jack Miller. And I really resonated with them and still do think he, John Schaub's kind of been a um, kind of core mentor for me just virtually, you know, reading his book, building wealth one house at a time. And so those are sort of like framework, you know, education. But then in terms of just finding deals and the practical stuff, I remember going to a seminar, the very first seminar I went to and a lady named Vina Jones Cox spoke there. I don't know if y'all know her. Yeah, I've heard of her. Yeah. Yeah. She, but she was talking just about finding leads, like generating leads. And, and she just went through like several different campaigns that she used to find sellers, people who wanted to sell their house at a, at a discount. And I remember it just being really practical. And a couple of them that she talked about where I think one was called where you go out and find uh, landlords who've recently evicted their tenant. And in this was it's public records. I mean, every county or state has different ways they make those records yeah. public. But in Georgia, where I was when I first started, I moved to South Carolina after a year, but I heard that seminar and she talked about that. And I just remember taking that information and she kind of gave the example of how you go up there, you go to the courthouse, you ask for this, you ask for the list and, you put the list into a, your computer and then you start sending letters to the people who've recently evicted a tenant to ask them if they want to sell their house. And I was like, okay, I, I was just enough of a beginner. And this is kind of how everything went for me those days. Like I didn't know that what, what that nothing, that that wouldn't work. I just had to said, Oh, somebody said to do that. Why don't I just go do it? You know, 23 year old kid. And I was, I did that. And I started like sending out little handwritten cards to landlords in my town. And I did that and some other campaigns as well. And that's how I just started finding deals for other people. Like I didn't have the money to do it. I didn't have the know-how. I was basically what we call down South, like a bird dog where I would just, I would point to a deal and say, Hey, I found this opportunity. I don't know what to do with it. Kind of like a bird dog, a hunting dog yeah. who just point, point, so I point at something. I would just point at it and say, I don't know what to do with it. But like people like my dad who had money or when I moved to South Carolina, other or experienced investors, I would say, here's a deal. Like, can I figure out a way to make some money with you by me bringing you a deal? And that awesome. was, that, that was my strategy. Like I, I knew that I couldn't figure out everything else, but if I took one little slice of the business, which finding deals is a really important part of it's the front end of the funnel. I said, if I can get good at that if I, and I can add value to other people, I think I can figure out a way to make some money. And that's sort of how, it, how, how I kickstarted it. How, how long did it take from starting off as the bird dog until you actually were in your first deal, you know, where you were flipping it or doing whatever, since I think you said you were flipping first, right? Right. Yeah. It took about 12 months. So I, I for the first 12 months, I was just purely bird dogging deals. And then the first six months, I didn't make any money. That's where I was living in my parents' bedroom and just like, what am I doing? This is crazy. Uh, but I made, I, I did buy, I think about 10 deals in the second six months. So it kind of started that. working, made a little bit of money on each one of those deals um, and then 12 months after I started, that's when I, a, a friend of mine from college, a guy I met up in Clemson, he and I decided to kind of try to buy a deal together. So I, I figured out how to find the deal, had some experience with that. And we actually went to a professor that I'd met at the university who I knew was investing in real estate. And I, I, I told him that I was learning how to find deals. And I said, if I find a deal with these numbers and I, I put it on a piece of paper, I said, you know, we'll buy it. It'll be worth a hundred thousand. We'll try to buy it for 60 or 70,000 including all the repairs. 
would you find, could you find a way to give us the money and we split the profit somehow? That was all I knew. I just knew like one basic formula. I knew I could try to buy it low. And he said, yeah, I'll come up with the money and we'll, we'll figure out a way to split it. And we, we just figured out, we split it three ways on that first deal. Me, my business partner, and this money guy. And after that, we started, he started loaning us the money or the, we talked to local banks to loan us the money instead of us having to have a partner. And we, we did a couple flips the first year, a couple more the next year, and we're sort of off to the races from there. So you were going with the old private money or, or financing that way. When did you clue into creative real estate and seller financing and all that fun stuff? It was from the beginning and it was more like a necessity than it was like me having any brilliant flash of insight. It was just, all right, I'm 23 years old. And when I walk into the bank and tell them that I got A's in college and I have a really good college resume, they don't actually give me any money. Like that doesn't help me at all. <laughs> they actually want to see that I have a W-2 job and can make some income. All right, that's interesting. So I knew, like I did get a, banker loan, a bank loan here or there from like local commercial banks. But for the most part, I knew that if I was going to control my own destiny, it was talking to people like this professor and his, his friends. And actually, one of my first private la- lenders was my grandmother. <laughs> she, she was, awesome. she's probably my third private lender, but she heard at Thanksgiving dinner, I was telling her, she was worried about me. She's like, you didn't go to med school. You didn't do this stuff. What are you doing? Like going out there trying to buy real estate. You can't do that. And so she was just worried about me and I was telling her about it. I said, like, no, here's, here's what we're doing. Like I found a, ha- a house worth this much and you know, I, I go to, so, and then she said, well, how do you get the money? Like, you can't get the money. You're, you know, she, same thing the banker was saying. And I said, well, I have this other guy. He has some money just sitting there making one or two. And he loans it to me and I pay him 10%. And then I flip the house and I make money. She's like, you're, you're paying somebody 10% interest? I said, yeah. And so then she got worried again. She's like, you, you can't do that. You're going to go out of business paying people 10% interest. And so, but she, she came around and she actually followed up with me, my grandmother and said, all right, I've got 60,000 bucks over here. Like, that, let me in on that. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to, I want to, cause this stock guy over here is not doing well by me and I don't like the stock market. Can I loan you that money? And so I said, yeah, we need to make sure we do this like very officially and go to a closing attorney and all that. But that's sort of how it worked. I just, I, I would tell stories to people and try to position in a way that made is a good deal for them as well. And it also helped me and we would all make money together. And that's how I funded, I would say almost all of the deals early on were either private money or seller financing. I would do the same thing with a seller. I would say, all right, I can pay you cash, pay you this price. I'll pay you a little bit of a premium, not a whole, you know big premium, but I'll pay you a little bit more if you'll let me pay you 4% interest for the next 15 years. Um, and, and then, so I found some sellers who would do that and I was able to buy some of my first rental properties doing it that way. That is so awesome. I think people get hung up on like, well, wait a minute, if I offer them that, they're not going to think that's a good deal. That's not high enough interest or that's not whatever. And the truth of the matter is we don't know what people are willing to agree to. I mean, you just have to ask. And if they say that's not enough, then go higher. Right. I think people get afraid of, of making the offer that works for them because they're too worried about what the response is going to be and they're going to scare that person off, right? Exactly, um, yeah. Yeah, and that goes back to me being a beginner. Sometimes you, when you have a beginner's mind, you don't know what, what you, you don't have that voice in your head that knows too much. And right. I, when, when you have that voice in your head that knows too much because of experiences, that sometimes that holds you back. And it can be, I mean, it can be helpful too because it keeps you out of dangerous places, but as, as a, an entrepreneur, I think sometimes we have to go, I, I find this for myself, like I need to go back to zero like every year because right. things change and sometimes the, the experiences I had in the past might not really be true. Like I might be interpreting them in a different way. So I, I find it very refreshing to learn from other beginners and to act like a beginner. Um, as, as soon as you become an expert that just knows so much, you, you, it gets heavy like you, you've got it all figured out when nobody really has it figured out. We've all got to, you know, start back over and the next deal is brand new. And so I, th- I think that attitude can help you um, learn more, try new things, innovate. And, and that's, that's what um, I, I 100% agree with you. With you. And uh, we are actually kicking off a podcast series within the Nuts and Bolts of Real Estate Investing podcast, same podcast, but once a month, we are going to have like a series called my first three deals and we are going to be taking local investors here and talking about the good, bad, ugly, and hopefully the funny um, on a podcast once a month for all you uh, of us that follow us regularly. It's going to be fun. 
I think we have Dan coming up on what is it June sixth or something like that. Joe, just coming up pretty soon. Uh, we'll be cook- kicking that off. So stay tuned for that because you're right. I host a weekly roundtable small group mastermind, and people of all experience levels come. They are, you know, brokers or broker investors or just investors and wholesalers and flippers and buy and holds and conventional lenders and hard money lenders. And we get about, I'm trying to keep it somewhat not too large because we sit around the table looking at each other in the face with no topic. We just show up. Um, And what happens is absolutely magic. And Hmm. every single week it changes and it's different and the conversation's different and we all walk away just going, holy crap, that was awesome. Sounds and great. it inspired me to kick off this new podcast series. So I'm excited. Um, we have one, like I said, I think it's around June 6th or whatever coming up that we're going to be recording our first episode of that. Um, right on, right on. Mark, so curious, yeah. back in the day, or I don't know if you're still, if you're doing more coaching these days, or um, what was your best source of marketing? Was it door knocking? Was it leaving post-it notes? Was it direct mail? Either back then when you were cruising and grabbing deals all over the place or, or, or now? What do you, what's your feelings about marketing these days? Yeah, it's a good now? question. Like, I guess I have two answers to that. One, one answer is just like everything worked at one point in time, you know? So like right. I've tried all, all of that. Um, I, I go back to door knocking a lot. Like when people ask me like, what's one thing you would do starting right now to go out and find a deal, I would say like, go walk your dog in your target neighborhood or push a stroller if you have kids or something. Like just getting out on, on the ground, riding it, walking a neighborhood is like, there's just so many good things that happen in terms of learning your market, finding vacant houses, calling for sale by owners, talking to neighbors. Like I, I just really like that. Plus you get some exercise and your mind starts working better. So I just think there's like multiple, multiple benefits there. Um, Absolutely. And there's, there's, there's apps that you can use, like even property radar, I believe, and mm-hmm. driving dollars, I think maybe, but property radar will tell you if it's a rental or if it's a, right uh-huh. when you're standing in front of the house. Perfect. How that's stellar nice. is that, you know? It's gotten so much easier, man. I used to have to actually go talk to people, like, you know, right. knock on the door. Right <laughs> you got that right, no doubt. Yeah. I agree. I think driving for dollars and door knocking, especially even if you're experienced, you know, uh, and you have the money you can spend on marketing. I mean, you pro- you do need to have a line in every stream. It's so competitive to these days. But I always tell people, hey, look, um, you guys are a bunch of investors and you go to these meetups and all this stuff and you're hanging out, you're all asking and wanting the same things. And then you go home and you live your life and you forget to open your mouth in your daily life. I mean, you guys are sitting there surrounded by free leads with no competition. Yep. If you would remember to talk about real estate and show your enthusiasm and excitement and you know talk as if or use your credibility sitting on the playground at school or yeah. hanging out, you know, whatever. I mean, that's right. You know, that's that, like that, was, free leads that, was, that was actually my second answer. Yeah, like networking has been by far, even to today, like, like the, the direct mail and door knocking and all those more active forms of marketing. Like I've spent money, tons of money on doing those and those have been effective. But to me, like the best return on investment is exactly what you're talking about is over time, I started deliberately building a network of people who knew what I was doing and who would send me leads and send me opportunities. And that, that was, I mean, everybody in my, I don't do it as much deliberately now. It's just kind of have some, re, have some reverberations from just what I've done in the past but I actually have like, you know, I had a local newsletter, like a print newsletter in like 2000, what was that? 2005 and six. Like I would have 150, 200 people that I knew, my attorney, local mortgage brokers, local friends, family. And I would just send out like a monthly newsletter saying, here's what I'm up to. Here's what I'm doing. Here's how things are going. Here's what I'm looking for. And I can't tell you how many like in 2007, we, we, it was our biggest year of buying properties, you know, just volume wise. Hmm, and I I wonder why. Up, and it was like <laughs> you know, 50 or 60% of the properties we bought were from those just like deliberate acts of trying to get networking and kind of referrals coming in. And that is, and that, that is a ninja tip. I hope you guys just heard what he said because <clears throat> you're all capable of doing that and you would probably all sending it to different people. And that, mm-hmm. I believe that is, that is maybe going to be the nugget, one of the biggest nuggets that comes out of today's conversation. If you guys push a little rewind and listen to what he said again, uh-huh. because you can do that 
Um, even so today, you know, I could do a better job at that. And some of our friends are already doing that. Um, shout out to, you know, Arivan Kasim, our friends who, who kind of have their own twist on that with a young guy vibe and music and all that stuff and connecting mm -hmm. with their community. Those guys love you guys, but um, that's awesome. Well, <clears throat> I noticed on your website and all your awesome content there, you have something called your uh, money life manifesto. Can you tell us what that's about? Yeah, it's, it's sort of it's what I try to share with everybody first before I get into like the nuts and bolts of real estate and all the cool like tactical stuff like driving for dollars and all that. Like I, I just try to set the stage and say like why why am I even sharing this information? Like why why is this important to me? And you know I'm kind of projecting maybe why this might be important to you is that money you know money is this thing that we're trying to solve. And I actually go back and give an uh, an example from like ancient Greek philosophy. So you're you're pretty close to this, Joe. You're you're over in Italy, so maybe you can go to go to Greece and go back to where Aristotle and some of those guys were. Um, but Aristotle had this idea that there like good things in life, like virtues, like good ways of being, like uh, courage is one example. So like courage, we think is a good thing, right? Well, on one end of courage, like you can be too extreme and have too much courage. You can be like really brash, rash, and jump out of an airplane without a parachute. And on the other end of courage, you could be like a coward. You don't have enough courage, and I, I really like that idea and I compared it with money and I said in the money life manifesto, you know, money is kind of the same way. Like if you, if you emphasize it too much, then you become like, you become like kind of rat on a wheel. You're just always working, working, working for money and you're, or you get greedy or you get, you know, so obsessive about money that it, you can never, it's never enough. Um, but on the other end, you know, there's, I have friends who are very good people and, you know, they're socially conscious and they say, you know, money's, money's no good. Money's evil. You capitalists are always going after money. And my point to them is like, you know, not having money is not good either. Like it's not, there's nothing noble about having to beg people for money or not having enough. Like having money could be a tool that helps you out. And so like somewhere in the middle there is what is like kind of that, you know, elusive place, but where we all find it for ourselves, where you have enough and where money is satisfied, but it's not, you're not like putting it on a pedestal, but you're not ignoring it. And so that's the magical middle ground of money is kind of like the, the place where you are, you know, earning enough money, either passively from your investments. Um, you also have a mindset that, you know, look, I don't, you know, I'm always going to grow. I'm always going to do more, but I don't have to keep on like proving to myself that I'm good enough just by earning more money. And that's a sort of a goal I've had for myself. And so for example, like having enough money for my wife and kids and I to travel and go on trips, like that's, that's awesome. Like it's really fun. It's been like an enriching experience. But every time I do one of those trips, you know, I'm not out buying as many houses. I'm not growing as much. And I have to admit, there's like a part of me that when I watch a Bigger Pockets podcast or something and I see some guy, some lady or some guy who's bought 50 houses this year and they're killing it and they're doing awesome. I'm like, man, you know, I, I think I could be doing that. Um, but, but then you come back and you say, wait a minute, like what, why did I get in this in the first place? Like what's important to me? What are the values in my life that money is serving? And so I, I think I'm that's really so what it's all about. That do that because the success, any success in anything that you do, and we preach this and, and remind everybody here because with social media and, you know, like you said, watching people on bigger pockets or anywhere on Facebook and all these things or, as far as it's all fluff. And most of the time what people are fluffing and puffing about isn't exactly accurate. Yes. Right? They might <laughs> right. do 50 deals, but maybe they, they lost on a bunch of those, especially yeah. in the last half of last year. Right. And yeah. so the, the truth of the matter is, is that that manifesto, if we're going to use that word is, um, is actually individually defined by everybody. There is no right answer. It's your right answer that matters, right? What's mm. what Joe wants and what I want and what you want can be completely different. None of us are right or wrong. It That's just right. all matters as if we have, we're achieving our own. And, and if we're able to, you know, fend off the social influences, you know, that make us fluctuate in how we feel, like you said, you know, watching somebody on 50 po bigger pockets, say they flip 50 houses yet. And you're like, well, geez, it seems like I don't think they seem that was much smarter than me. I think I could do that. But, you know, I, I, I am, um, have been real hardcore trying to focus on that for myself also because, um, and, and I, I'm succeeding. I guess I'll say I'm succeeding because I've taken the pressure off myself to care about all that and only focused on 
my wants and needs uh, and realized, you know what? I'm pretty good. You know, <laughs> things are going pretty good. Um, and I, I'm going to continue pushing forward like we all want to, but it's a very, very valid point. And, you know, that for all you guys listening, you know, it's all individual success is individually defined. If your goal is to, you know, earn enough money or passive income that you can take a big family trip every year and you do that, you're probably way ahead than people that, you know, just continuously chase the, like you said, like a rat race thing. Um, if you can accomplish what you set out to do, no matter how big or small, and then just keep moving the ball forward for yourself, right? Well said. Um, I, I agree. Excellent. You know what I've noticed uh, talking about? I want to go back to the word courage because I was thinking about how awesome your description was on the, you know, you can use the same word and be at two opposite ends of it. What I have found, especially in the last six months, I'll say, with what we're doing with our small group roundtable mastermind, rather than getting in a room full of a hundred people um, that are networking and, and so forth and not having deep, meaningful conversations or accomplishing, helping anybody is that courage also comes from support and community. And I cannot express to you guys that you, wherever you're listening from um, you know, you get all your online, you know, your big guru help or your, awesome uh, coaching help or wherever you're getting your real estate education from bigger pockets and all that stuff. But for God's sakes, plug in to your local real estate, um, you know, uh, investment club and find the people in there that you identify with and just simply sit around for an hour every week or every two weeks or whatever you can make time for and just sit and talk and have conversations and get help from each other. And you will be that courage thing that we're talking about will be um, sneaking up on you. And all of a sudden you feel surrounded by a boost of courage because you have somebody to come back to the next week and say, well, I tried it and this is what happened. That's what we're doing. We have this guy, Jack, what's up, Jack, if you're listening, that comes every week to our meeting. He's a new wholesaler. I think he's like 90 to 120 days in or something like that, right? Every week he comes and we say, hey, Jack, we can't wait for him to come, actually. We say, hey, Jack, what happened last week? There's a room full of experienced investors or new investors or everybody in between, but we can't wait to hear what Jack tells us. Because he, we're watching him grow. And every week we give him like a go try this this week or tweak this this week and then come back and report it to us. And I guarantee you that we have given him the courage and he got a deal in his first 90 days. And that is like unheard of around here, honestly. Because yeah. it's so competitive. And I think part of it is because of the courage that he had to keep pushing through. I love that word because he has a support group. He knows that he's got, he's got us and we got his back with support and community and camaraderie and all that. That's can't sure. be overvalued, you know, love sure. it. Yeah. I've been part right. of my local like real estate group in Greenville as well. So for sure. Yeah. Do you, do you, uh, do you host one out there? Uh, I've been, I've been a member of mine It's upstate Korea real estate investors association for 16 years now. So from the very beginning, I used to go to the local beginners group and participate in it. And then I'll, I've taught classes there now friends there. So I had hundred percent and it, it helps you not be too, too rash. Like I was talking about, you know, you, you can go on either end. You can be so fearful that you never do anything. That's what a lot of happens. A lot of people analysis paralysis and just get stuck. But then there's some people who just go too way too much and too crazy, you know, and just jump off a cliff without a parachute. Exactly. And uh, you don't, you don't want to do either one of those. And so we, we're, we're social creatures, right? We work in teams. I used to play team sports all the time. I think we, we play better when we find a, a group of people, kind of like our tribe, who who can help us uh, make decisions, that's how we learn. That's how we, you know, grow. And so I couldn't couldn't agree more. That's a very well, good. I, yes, I love the word tribe. That's a good word. So let's get back to your awesome, um, you know, coaching and your your website that everybody should go check out. It's CoachCarson.com, um, and on there you offer a real estate investing um, toolbox to investors where you have like 85 plus tools and resources for investors. Um, so I was thinking about it when I was looking over your stuff and I'm like, well, my dad, you know, my dad's a retired pharmacist, right? And, you know, people used to go to him and 
they get their, you know, basic kit, I'll say, you know, when you have a cough or a cold or flu, you have all, you're always going to have like, you know, the ibuprofen or the other little, you know, cough and cold kit that you're going to keep um, as your staple in your household at all times. Right. right. So you got all these awesome tools. I mean, you guys should check it out. It's completely awesome at coachcarson.com. But uh, as far as a starter kit, everyone should have in regards to resources and tools, or, or maybe the answer is going to depend on what discipline of real estate, if you want to flip or buy and hold or whatever. But are there a few tools you think everyone should have? Like, yeah, that's a good, it is a good question. Like, I, I, I'm thinking about how I would answer that because I, th- I think part of it is like, let's say, depending on your business model, like, so let's, let's start with um, somebody who's going to buy rental properties, for example, and because I'm, I'm some tools in specific. Like if you, if you were going to tell me like, what's the most important thing that I've learned and the tool I use to help my rental property business do well, I would say it's being able to, to screen and evaluate my tenants well. And, and so as a landlord, like that, like one thing that's really changed the game for us is having a, a, a nice um, kind of online property management software that we used to just do everything manually, you know, and, and every, the technology is so awesome these days to be able to not only help you on your, your end as a landlord to screen tenants well to get a good background check and do all that, but also from the user experience of your tenant, like how, is it so much easier for them to apply, to be able to make their payments online, to be able to see docu- the copies of their leases online. So like I, I would say that's one of the, you know, really kind of game changer tools for rental. If you're any of your listeners are, there's going to be a landlord. Like I use a couple different tools. I mean, there's probably other ones out there too, but I use um, cozy.co for my just like kind of small, my wife and I own a uh, rental on our own kind of outside of our business that we manage. And we use that for managing our tenant that way. And then when we're um, like our, our business that owns and self manages more properties, we use Buildium is a, like an online, which, which you have to pay for. Cozy's free. And then your tenants pay for the credit checks Whereas Buildium is more of like a, um, you know, a, a property management software virtually that then has a lot more bells and whistles and systems. And it's been really a game changer for us too. Um, so I, I think awesome. that's a very specific we actually thing. Did a, we actually that's did a deep dive, um, deep dive uh, podcast with Cozy. Um, so if you guys are listening and, you know, um, you know Chad's absolutely right, uh, n- nailing it on the head right here. I mean, screening your tenants and all that ease and um, how people want to transact these days. Um, Joe, maybe you can link the cozy um, podcast here at the, to this one as well at the bottom of the show notes today. But yeah, yeah. that's, that's, that's absolutely a fantastic one. What, what else you got? What else might come to mind? Yeah. So I, I mean, that, that's one with for landlords. Um, I would say just for when you're, when you're just buying properties, I'll go back to that because that was the first thing I learned how to do. And, and so I think a toolbox of, yeah, I compare, I compare finding deals to fishing. I think you used that analogy earlier as well. And so like the, the tool of having different ways to generate leads to potentially find uh, new properties, like is even more, to, if you're in a competitive market, like that's one of the most important things you got, because you have no business if you can't buy and find a good deal. And if, if all you have is one fishing line, which is the MLS to go out and find deals on the MLS, like I still look at the MLS all the time. But if that's your only way of finding deals, uh, your fishing is going to get is going to dry up. You're going to you're going to go hungry. You're not going to get any fish on your fishing line. So like what I like to have is you know multiple fishing lines, multiple tools, and some of those could be like learning you know some of the kind of classic direct mail type techniques. Um, but then there's also newer ones like a, you know I, I do a lot of social media like with my blog and with like kind of Coach Carson stuff. I haven't done a lot of it with my real estate business, but I think that's very applicable right now. Like um, I I used my example of having a newsletter earlier. Like I I did a print (laughs) newsletter in 2005 and six, like, but today you could start a, you know, your face through your Facebook page. You could start a local podcast. Like I've had an idea of if I were starting over in Clemson where I am, I would go, I wouldn't necessarily have a real estate investing podcast. I would just do a local market podcast. Like if I were a realtor, if I were a mortgage broker, and I would just like, what, what's the news of the day in Clemson, South Carolina? Like, what are people up to? I would just have 15 minute little segments. I would interview the mayor. I would talk to the local attorney. I would talk to the local pharmacist. I would talk to some person on the street. Hey, what's up with you? What's going on in Clemson? And, you know, at the beginning of every show and the end of every show, I'd be saying, this, this episode is brought to you by 
Chad buys houses in Clemson. <laughs> you know, there, there you go. Right. Go to, go to Chad buys houses.com. That's not a real website. I need to get that one. But um, <laughs> you know, that, that kind of thing, like if, if you can find like creative different ways, that's a tool, like a creative different way to market yourself and put yourself out there. You've got to stay ahead of the curve. You got to get, you got to use the tools that are out there. And to me, like social media is so incredible. Um, it's also really bad in some respects, but it's really incredible because it's free and, and it, to start off. It's easy. There's a low barrier to entry and you can communicate directly with your, your network and the world and you can grow and scale pretty quickly. And it's cost is actually cost effectively better than, you know, some of the other forms of, of doing that. I found myself couldn't okay. agree with you more. Love your ideas on, uh, you know, these, you know, outside the box, not, you know, like the newsletter or having, I think Tucker Marahu does that guys down in Portland. He has the Portland, uh, you know, um, real estate podcast and it's not about flipping. It's, um, it is real estate specific, but I like your idea better. Just like being the neighborhood guy. Like we have those publications out here where we live. Like I live in the, I live out in the Ballard area and we have like myballard.com, which is like an online, um, you know, neighborhood thing, but nobody's has a podcast. So I'm going to steal your idea. Go for it. Yeah. I mean, that, that, you got to be a local celebrity. Like my co-host, you know, okay. Joe, um, you know, on that, that's a good one. I like it. Awesome. So you're speaking of, so you're a blogger, you follow, I think probably a lot of other blogs and stuff. What, what is Feedly? I saw that on your site. What is that? Ooh, Feedly. What is Feedly? Is that on my site? Really? (laughs) Yeah. I think you said that um, maybe it helps you manage them or something like that. Uh, Well, um, I think Feedly might be just one of the, one of the ways I kind of get out the word, get the word out, like different, different kind of channels. But like, uh, you know, I I host my site on web uh, WordPress. It's just a WordPress site. And then I kind of plug into all the other different social media channels that way. Like, and I mean, for really, this is a good point. We were talking about the marketing tools, like, whether you're a real estate investor marketing with online or a blog like I do, you know, like the, I, I'm, I compare this to like, if you think back over the last 50 years or before the internet kind of changed things, you had radio, you had TV and you had newspapers or magazines, like you had written audio video. <clears throat> and those are the ways that most of us got our information, right? Like we would go read a newspaper. If we want to get local news. If we wanted to get, you know, we'd have a local radio station. Well, the thing that's amazing about all of this and what I found with my, my education blog on teaching people real estate investing is like, that's, that's totally transformed. Like newspapers are not really profitable anymore. Like you, they don't make money. If you had not talked to local newspaper people, there might be a few that make money, but like websites are, you know, I have a friend who's a, has a realist or has a sports website for Clemson sports and it's much better, much better business now than the local newspaper is. And, right. and so the point is that all of us, we, we need to think about ourselves as a media company that's really what we are. Like what, if, whether you're a pharmacist, a, a real estate investor, a realtor, whatever you are, like you, you, if you can go out and create media that's helpful to people and that, that solves their problems, you can then, you can be your own advertiser. You can, you know, I, I have a business on the back end of that media company, um, but that's really, that's the, that's the cutting edge right now. That's the way people are adding value to customers and kind of cutting through the noise because there's so much noise out there. And so really what, what you have to do is find a way to be valuable to people and on the front end. And, and so that's, if you can take that seed of an idea, that's a marketing idea that, that gets you in the door with people. It gets you known. It gets it, you know, it's, it's kind of reciprocity. They feel good about the fact that you gave them some information. Right. And that's, what I'm, that's what I try to do with my blog too. You know, the, the blogging strategy is you have tons and tons of free information. And then if you want to monetize it, you can, not everybody does like, but I have some online courses that people want to go a little deeper instead of doing coaching these days, I do more like an online kind of mastermind community through my online courses. And so it's not for everybody, you know, 95% of the people don't just read my blog or listen to the podcast and that's great. And so some of you have the same thing with your real estate kind of podcast or local blog or whatever. Um, That's fine. You want lots and lots of people on there sharing it and sharing with other people. And then a small number of them will turn into customers who can actually sell you a house or refer you a house or do something else. Absolutely. Um, well, you're, you are, uh, I will venture to say most likely a very well-rounded guy in respect to your real estate knowledge and, you know, blogging and coaching and all that stuff. What is your, um, favorite, um, topic to teach or to talk about? I mean, I, I love, let's say that's a good question. 
I like breaking down like any of the complex topics that sometimes are intimidating for people and just trying to simplify them. And so like right now I'm kind of on a kick or the last year or so just doing like deal analysis. Like some people, some people just get paralyzed with running the numbers and doing the math. So I, I written, I wrote a series of articles and I've done some videos and things on just like a cap rate. Like, you know, what is a cap rate? Like, why does that matter? And it couldn't be anything more boring for some people. Like what a cap rate, really? That's, that's what you're writing an article about, but trying to like, break that down and explain it in a way and, and then offer it up as a, a tool that people remember and say, Oh, okay. Cap rate is a way to measure risk on a deal. And it's a way to evaluate a deal. It's a way to evaluate a market. And this, and so like giving people that, that, you know, lesson like that on something that might've been a topic they didn't really care about, or they didn't know how to use and then breaking it down, teaching it, giving them a, a good takeaway. Um, so I, I would say, you know, deal analysis has been one that's been really, I've enjoyed a lot. Um, but then lately I'm making a course on lead generation. A lot of the stuff we've been talking about today, I think that's why it's fresh in my mind. Well, and I so, can't wait to buy it. Yeah. So, it's, so that's, that's something I'm working on. Um, so I think my interests change. Like I, I like to be not only in real estate, I like to read a lot of different stuff. I like to read um, self-help. I like to read business books. I like to read, you know, all sorts of other literature, different things. And I, I found that at least for myself, you know, the, you get ideas from the most random places. Like if, if you're, if you open your mind up to different disciplines, the things that they don't seem like they make sense, they don't directly contribute to your real estate business at all. But if you let your mind go there and just be curious, sometimes they'll come back around and um, it, it reminds, it's like Steve, I remember a speech by Steve Jobs. He said the same thing. Like he was, he dropped out of college and had, you know, it was just like dropping in on classes about calligraphy of all things. Like he's like, it was just beautiful. He loved it. You know, he learned how to make invitations and do this beautiful writing, like with no hope that that would ever be practically <laughs> applicable to anything. But then like six or seven years later, he made the Macintosh computer and he transformed like the PC world from having these ugly, like computerized, like font that you used to see into actually having like sans serif and like nice, beautiful font. And it all was because of his calligraphy class that he, he dropped in on, you know, after he dropped out of college. That's awesome. And so I, I think, so I think that's kind of the way, like I would just encourage everybody to just be a learner period. Like just, just study, you know, use this real estate investing as an opportunity to, to grow and to learn, to challenge yourself. And if one area of the business seems really interesting to you, if you're, if you're totally into like flips and remodeling houses and HGTV and all that stuff, like, you know, follow that, like go with it, learn it, become good at it. If you're really into like financing and running the numbers and spreadsheets and, you know, there's a place for you too. like go with that and, and just find a way to go deep on a topic and learn a lot about it and make yourself valuable to the people around you. Make yourself valuable to the people around you by becoming an expert on the topics that you enjoy to learn about the most. Exactly. That is, that is it. That's a magic formula right there. No doubt. So how do, how do people get involved more with taking advantage of your coaching? What, is it, what does that look like for you? Um, is that that people, you create courses and they're, you know, I saw there was a couple on your site. I mean, I don't, you know, look super, you know, like topic driven. Mm -hmm. you, you zero on a certain topic and people can pick, listen to that course for something super affordable. Or how does the coaching um, or somebody who wanted to plug in more to you as, as coach? Sure. How does that yeah, work? Well, yeah. Thank you for asking. Like I have a kind of a, just an easy free way to do it. Like I have a, a weekly newsletter is the way most people stay in touch with me. So like they, if you go to my website, coachcarson.com forward slash newsletter. Um, it's just, I have a, a toolkit basically with a lot of practical tools and things you can get and you can just download those for free, stay in touch with me week by week. So that's, I would Let say like, you guys, he's, he's being modest. He has <laughs> like, over 10,000 or 11,000 people, or at least probably more than that, subscribe to this yeah. newsletter. So, so that, that's my main thing. That's why that's I really like messing out, guys, if you don't get it. <laughs> Thank you. So that, I mean, that is the, the main place I communicate with people. And then, you know, over time, like it, so people who are on there and they like what I'm talking about, I do have a, like, I have a course called Real Estate Start School that I open up twice per year. And so Real Estate Start School is it's for people who are just get either just getting started like brand new or people who are just starting to kind of restart or kind of re jump start their business pivot something like that so i have i take people through like a step by step process to, in a community in an online community with me and with other people in the class and we go through that that process of um, generating leads getting the money for your deals evaluating your market 
building a team. So all of those kind of key fundamentals, we go through that together and we do, you know, have a live component and then also video component. And so I have a lot of fun with that. That's, that's my opportunity where, you know, the blog is kind of, I'm talking to a lot of different people, but I'm talking kind of at a distance. That's where I get to know people, have office hours. You get, it's more of my, where I kind of scratch my coaching itch, you know, where I get to really know people and help them evaluate their deals. So that, I have both of those, both the news, kind of my free newsletter stuff. And then um, if you like that and you wanted to invest a little bit more in your education, then I have some, an online course called Real Estate Start School that I would love to connect with people on as well. Awesome. I have a selfish question for you. Um, sure. So when you built your, your website, it's so beautiful. I just, I love Thank it. You. It just this flows. It's almost like, you know, somebody, that's what I'm going to ask you. Did you, did you just build that out of your head? I mean, you're, I, I love it so much. Like, or did you, you know, have somebody coach you on and help you build that? Or is that just your personality coming out on those pages? Yeah, it, 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 it's like, it's like starts off ugly and gets, thank you for saying that, but it gets, it's just like iteration after iteration. Like if, I probably shouldn't encourage people to do this, but there's this thing called the Wayback Machine where you can look at somebody's website from like 10 years ago. And oh, it, really? mine, mine was ugly, 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 bad. So like, um, it's it's just been like evaluating other people's. And I always like collect ideas of what other people's websites look like that I really enjoy the user experience. And so well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save yours as one of my favorites then. How about that you. along those lines? I appreciate yeah. that. So everybody, even coaches, even Tony Robbins, everybody has mentors and coaches that are involved in their lives. Do you have anybody that you feel that is a mentor or a coach for you these days now that you're, now that you're also the coach? I need to get another mentor. I, I do have some mentors who've been my mentors for a long time. My dad is one who's been really helpful and my mom. They're both entrepreneurs and been very helpful. So again, I won the ovarian lottery there. I can go to my parents for, as mentors. Um, but then also I have a guy named uh, Louis Stone. Dr. Stone is what he was. A, he was the business professor who gave me my first loan to help me get started. There and you go. He, he has been a, a mentor to, to me uh, ever from the very beginning. Not only loaned me money, but also you know, sometimes I would get off track. We all get off track, right? And so mentors are there to, to be honest with you and to give you, honest, to tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. And he's been that kind of person for me. And so somebody, so I think we all like, it's, it's hard to find that person right off the bat. I think you have to see who you resonate with, but he's been that kind of person for me to where I can go. I can, even today, like I'll call him up and he's available and say, Hey, can we go take a walk? you know, I've got an hour and we'll go walk around, get a little exercise. He'll ask me what's going on in my life. Give me some feedback. And I actually wrote about him in my book a good bit too. And so there was a, there was a, a, a advice he gave me when I first met him where he said, Chad, do you want to know how, be- how to become rich? I was like, yeah, I'm a little college kid. Just graduating from college. Yeah. I want, of course I want to be- know how to become rich. And he told me a story that his mentor, when he was 23, he told him the exact same thing. And to, get, to keep it really brief, he said, he, his, this mentor said, Chad, if you want to be, or Louie, if you want to become rich, you've got to learn how to earn $30,000 a year. And this is back in the day, right? Earn 30,000 a year and live off 30,000 a year. Got it, Louie? All right. Got it. Yep. Now the next thing you got to do, Louie, you got to learn how to make 60,000 a year and live off 30,000 a year. Got it, Louie? Yeah. Yeah. I got it. Okay. I'm not done. Like third thing, Louie, you got to learn how to make 120,000 a year and still live off $30,000 a year. Got it, Louie? Yeah, I got it. Say, so, Louie, if you do that, you can't help but become rich. Nice. And that was his, his, so like he gives those kind of stories. He would tell me these stories like that. You know, I could have just abbreviated, abbreviated that and said, oh, you need to increase your savings gap. You need to save more money. That's how you get rich. But, you know, a good mentor would tell you those kind of stories, give you feedback. And he, he's, uh, you know, he's given me all sorts of little kind of stories and ideas like that, that have stuck with me over the years. I don't know about you guys, but I, for some reason, am ha- having a flashback to the movie Goodwill Hunting right now. <laughs> I don't know why I keep thinking about Goodwill Hunting. It sounds like a Goodwill Hunting. You guys remember that with yeah. Matt Damon? And, oh, yeah. Uh, I love that movie. Yeah, yeah. I love that one. That's awesome. Good stuff. Um, well, a couple more. I, I have kind of an interesting question because we're both in the coaching space and, and, and loving education and educating others and stuff like that. So uh, you and I both have two girls, right? We've, yes, I have two right. Girls, you have two girls. Um, you ever think about, you know, how you're going to educate them about, you know, the money life manifesto or at what age do you think the seeds should be planted with kids or young adults 
in your community about, you know, educating on the types of topics that we're talking about. Maybe that's real estate, but maybe that's more yeah. like the money life, you know, how to treat that. And are you yeah. involved in any of that stuff in your community? Because I'm, I am super interested for all you listening, anybody who wants to hang out and talk about this with me. I know, I know a couple of you have already expressed that interest to me, but that's something as a goal for me that I want to plug in because these kids are smart. My kids are turning 11 this summer and they are, you know, it's amazing what they're picking up just by hanging around me. But, uh, you know. Yeah. And that's a really, that's such a good question. Like I'm totally a student in this area. So like, I don't have any great answers, but my, my daughters are eight and six. And so they, my, my older one in particular is getting more interested. And so I think the two working hypotheses I have, hypotheses that I have are number one, just letting them be present with me. Like, it sounds like you're the same way. Like just letting, letting my daughters, if they're interested, like, Hey, I'm going out to look at a house. You want to go with me? Or, Hey, I'm going to make a, you know, I don't make many deposits at the bank anymore, but like if I were like, Hey, do you want to go to the bank and make a deposit with me and, and let, let her like fill out the deposit coupon and do that. Yeah. And, and it's so a- just, yeah. Just like being like looking over your shoulder. I just, I think that, um, that real world where they're, you're acknowledging them, you're taking along with them and, I think you have a just having that window of receptivity where they actually want to listen to you is is by um, is, is is open them because they're getting to go and do something fun with you, and so I think that's one way just be present like and that's that goes back to my money life manifesto like one of my biggest challenges is that I love I love business like I love entrepreneurship, but how I also want to be present with my with my family, and so right. I, that there's that there's a tension there, and so how can I do how can I build these like kind of spaces in my life where it's, it's focus on my family and not, and, and that, that intersection might be something like that. All right. Can I like, teach them about, I want them to see me being an entrepreneur. I want to see that, them to see me interacting with people because I, I've, I've heard as a parent, you know, reading parenting books and things, but just advice from other people is that like, they'll, they'll probably listen to like 1% of what I say if I'm lucky, <laughs> but they'll, <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll watch and they'll listen to like 90% of what I do. And so right. if I, can, if I can get them like watching it and observing me. And that'll, that, do, that does two things. One is they're watching me and that's, they're learning. But the other thing is it kind of ups my game. Like, all right, my, my daughters are watching me. Like I better up my game. I better not, you know, I better be my, on my best when I communicate with somebody. I better not treat somebody in a way that I think is not uh, up to my standards. I, I need to do business in such a way that I make my daughters and my wife proud, you know? And so I think it's a pretty cool virtuous circle to have kids you know, or anybody you're mentoring, not even your own kids, because then it, it, it forces the teacher is always the best student, right? We have to, we have to learn as we teach our kids and as we help them. So that's, that's my best answer at the moment. It's just, uh, I'll take it. Participate. I'll take it. Well, as we wrap up here, one last question, you wrote a book or maybe you've even wrote more than one book. What's your book just called more. and why'd you write it or how long did it take you to write it? Yeah, the book is called Retire Early with Real Estate, and it's my only book. It might be my only book for a while. <laughs> we'll see. Um, it was a partnership with Bigger Pockets. Um, I was actually talking to Brandon Turner a few years ago at a financial conference called FinCon, and he and I were both blogging at the time. He said, "Hey, you ought to reach out and write a book," because it was the early stages of when he was he had he and one other person had done a book at Bigger Pockets. Mm-hmm. And so one thing led to another, and we worked out a title. And my interest, I, I sort of see myself at the intersection in my blogging life of the financial independence community, like Mr. Money Mustache and Choose FI and a lot of those people I'm really close with. And then the real estate community, Bigger Pockets and that, that whole side of things. So I'm, I, I like to be like right on the intersection of those two. And, and so that's what this book is about. It's a, it's, a, it's a blueprint or a map. If you're either a new investor or somebody who's a little bit closer to having, thinking that you can achieve financial independence, I give sort of a blueprint on how to do that. Here are the steps, here are the different stages, here are the different tools you can use within real estate investing, like debt snowballs and the Burr strategy and house hacking and all those things you've probably heard. I try to put those into like an organized fashion of how can you use this to retire a heck of a lot earlier than you probably thought you could. You know, you might've been thinking 30, 40 years. Let's start talking about five, 10, 15 years if you really have a plan and if you really work a plan. And I gave examples. So I got to interview 25, 24 other people. So I had, and I featured their stories in the book 
and oh got to show like the real numbers. And I feel like so I that's... need to get off this podcast so I can go buy the book. <laughs> yeah, and it's got an audio book too with me, me talking oh. for better or worse. So if anybody wants to go to Audible, you can check it out there too. Sweet. I shall do that. Awesome stuff. Well, um, we need to let Joe um, get to his bedtime or his, you know, um, Italian pizza or, you know, yeah. pasta, whatever he's going to be doing because it's nighttime there. Um, I assume he's still <laughs> with us and he's not, uh, you know, sipping a, you know, whatever, or a Roman cocktail somewhere right now. But um, chat, so awesome. And I don't know if you ever get out to the Seattle area, if we can yeah. make it. You, maybe maybe you can come out to the Pacific Northwest Big Badass Real Estate Expo next year um, to Tarl and, and Grace's event. That would be uh, great. I'm sure some of your other friends might be, you probably know, might be there. Brandon Turner there was there this year, of course. And, mm-hmm. and we'll get a chance to um, say hello in person. Or we well, love that. Yeah, I've Is got it? friends out in Seattle or out north of Seattle. I've got Bellingham and some other areas near there and in nice. Seattle as well. So I would love to love to come up that way. It's a good spot. Let us know when you're coming so we can give you a warm uh, Seattle welcome. Thank you. And I that can't, sounds uh, great. Th- thank you for having you me. So much. Yeah. And uh, Joe is, um, well, we're just going to remind you guys, there's a little admin stuff here at the end, um, that every single Tuesday, every single Tuesday, we have a killer, awesome, you know, small group, free coaching uh, mastermind in Burien. We are actually starting some other locations to be announced on that. Um, but we are right now in Burien at Angelo's. You can find it on meetup. Just look for Seattle investors club on meetup, or it's posted now as an event, I think on our Seattle investors club, Facebook pages, but 12 PM to 2 PM. I promise you, you will be spectacularly surprised if you haven't been yet to the power of what a small group mastermind, um, any experience level, all experience levels, any, any, you know, bring your jokes and bring your um, empty belly because we'll fill you up full of some beef cannelloni as well at the same time. But um, hope to see you guys there. Um, we also have a, our quarterly event coming up. Um, which is our kind of our old format style of Seattle Investors Club, where we're having a presentation and an in-person meeting. Is that June 25th, Joe? What's the date on that? Yeah, June 25th. June 25th, we have one of our own homegrown local, I'll call them secret celebrities, Mr. Andrew, quote, Drew Niffen will be with us from Nighthawk Equity. And for those of you who love or want to know more about apartment investing, how to underwrite those deals, who are looking for some coaching in regards to that. Um, Some of you may or may not have heard, probably lots of you have heard of Michael Blanc, um, that he is a, you know, national syndicator and multifamily expert and coach. And Drew Niffin, our local um, Pacific Northwest guy, is, was Michael Blanc's first coach and is actually his equity partner in um, Nighthawk Equity. So we are going to have a spectacular uh, meetup presentation on June 25th. I think it's that's a is that a Tuesday, Joe? It's 6:30 p.m. I don't remember. Yeah, I believe what it's day. a Tuesday. I yeah, I think Tuesday. it's a Tuesday. But June 25th, check mark your calendars. 6:30 to like nine at Renton Technical College, our old stomping grounds. I guarantee you, um, Drew is as eloquent here as Chad is, wonderful human being, excellent coach, and um, you're going to get some surprise nuggets you've probably never heard before and some opportunities, big opportunities um, that Drew will be able to offer you guys um, if you're able to make it to that meetup. Um, So I hope to see you there. Otherwise, I hope to see you on a Tuesday. Uh, Stay tuned. Join our Facebook page, go to Seattle Investors Club on Facebook and and join. We'll ask you a few questions. And if you don't answer them, we won't let you in. So make sure you answer those questions. But other than that, Joseph, where can they can find the details about today's podcast? Yeah, we got a lot of good links and stuff in the show notes. You can get to them at seattleinvestorsclub.com slash 78. That's seattleinvestorsclub.com slash 78. And remember that this show is free to subscribe to. So head over to iTunes, hit subscribe, and leave us a review if you like us. Super awesome. Chad, if you're there, I'll say thanks once again. I'm here. Um, It's a lot of fun. Thanks for having me and look forward to meeting you in person as well. 
All right, guys, over and out, and uh, be safe, be kind. See you later. Thanks for listening to the Seattle Investors Club podcast. If you have questions that you'd like to have answered on the show, shoot us an email at info at seattleinvestorsclub.com. Now go out, take that action, and build that real estate business. Thanks for listening.